Thank you, Susan. Welcome everyone to our open webinar on bridging divides in mediation and how to overcome group differences in mediation. Um, for those of you who have not joined us before, a special welcome wherever you're coming from today. Um, I'm gonna to talk in a few minutes about strategies for bridging divides, but before I get to that, uh, this past weekend was a very rainy weekend here in Northern California and it gave me the opportunity uh, to take a pause in my schedule, lie on the couch and open a book that I had picked up uh, from Dr. William Urey, most of you know is the author of Getting to Yes and the, one of the founders of uh, ADR uh, at Harvard Business School and the program on negotiation. The book is entitled uh, Possible and it's uh, how we survive and thrive in the age of conflict. Um, and while uh, Dr. Yuri's uh, foray into this timely topic of how we address uh, our deepest differences without uh, destroying everything that binds us together, uh, it does focus more on the macro issues of how we learn to work together. But it also, I think, is a good uh, segue for us uh, in terms of today's um, webinar on bridging divides in mediation. Um, before I get to actual strategies for bridging divides, I think it's important to talk somewhat generally about some of the influences uh, and drivers of our individualized behaviors. It's using, continuing to use sort of my uh, weather metaphor. Uh, if we're trying to identify the weather in the room, it's helpful to understand the trade winds that are sort of blowing uh, above us. And so we have to almost by definition, I think, start by looking at what sort of has brought us to this moment, looking through a lens of neurobiological and anthropological influences helps guide us as we think uh, more deeply about strategies for bridging divides. So what do I mean by that when I talk about these uh, broader influences? Well, fortunately, the beauty for me of mediating every day is I develop a rich petri dish of examples of um, group behavior. And when I say group behavior, um, I talk both in terms of groups themselves as well as group representatives. For today's conversation, it's important to visualize. We don't necessarily mean having 50 people on one side of the table and 50 people on the other side. It may well be and usually is representatives of those groups that are still exhibiting group behaviors. And I'll come and talk about that in more detail in the uh, hour or so ahead. But again, back to these overarching influences. Um, we are uh, social animals. Uh, I have uh, often said from a psychological perspective, we've got two very basic human needs. One is growth and the other is connection. We're gonna focus more on today's uh, topic in developing the idea of connection as a uh, driver of uh, behavior. But we are social animals. Uh, in the book, Sapiens, uh, many of you may have read Yuval Harat, uh, Harari. Uh, Mr. Harari describes our evolutionary ascent as, as social beings, uh, observing that our brains are hardwired to seek out the company of others. And we've known this for some time, uh, anecdotally. Um, Bill Urey's early work as an anthropologist studying uh, civilizations in Africa, other people's work studying uh, civilizations in South America. Um, early cultures uh, often used uh, ostracization, uh, pushing people out of the community as a means of punishment. Um, we know that, uh, social, uh, that uh, um, isolation uh, in prison um, is uh, um, often described as cruel and unusual punishment because solitary confinement can lead to stressful uh, uh, results, both mental and physical. Uh, this idea of connection is central to who we are as human beings and at least has a powerful influence of pulling us together. Yet there are countervailing uh, um, pressures at work and those uh, include uh, us uh, looking to um, uh, have cultural and um, ethnic and other differences. Uh, for example, we know that infants as young as six months old can recognize facial differences. They respond more favorably to those facial images that look similar to who they are and respond uh, uh, much less favorably uh, when exposed to faces that reflect those from different cultures or ethnic groups. Um, we know that over time, um, we tend to focus more our, on our differences than our similarities. 
Um, we tend to isolate ourselves with life choices. Uh, we create a virtual echo chamber of perspectives and cultural influences, and we thus create our own in-group and out-group thinking. What do I mean by in-group and out-group? It's a phrase that many of us have heard and sometimes uh, use, but obviously we should take a moment and define it. In-group behavior, in-group bias, really means that people within that group show uh, a preference for other people within their group. Uh, they tend to uh, overlook differences of in-group members and they uh, unjustifiably form more favorable views of those they associate with. Out-group bias is just the opposite. It means sort of automatically disliking someone else uh, who's not within your own group. Even worse, sort of perceiving all of the out-group members as being the same without regard to individual differences. We're gonna talk a bit about what impact that has in mediation here momentarily. But it does, this concept of bias does remind me that it is important, particularly for those of you who are newer to these webinars, uh, to uh, help understand and drill down on the concept of implicit bias. Um, we know uh, that uh, over thousands and th millions of years, the human brain has evolved uh, to adapt uh, in many ways. And one of the ways it has adapted is to the literally thousands of data points of information that besiege us moment to moment uh, in our human brains. And as a consequence of that sheer volume of data coming from our environment, our brains are hardwired to process that information at a subconscious level, sort of robbing us of the uh, ability to make uh, real-time individualized decisions in many instances and to make that, uh, those decisions without conscious awareness. And this too has an impact uh, on our ability to respond to those that are different uh, from us and to consciously uh, think, if not avoid, uh, in-group, out-group biases. And finally, in terms of an overview, before I address some of the uh, uh, specifics of today's topic that brings us together, we know from a neurobiological level that our brain undergoes changes when we are in stress and conflict. We know that uh, in, in conflict, that our brains uh, respond in a way that exacerbates group differences. Uh, when we encounter conflict, when we're under stress, Research shows that there's a tendency for us to simplify, really to oversimplify, to generalize uh, differences. And uh, it shows that there's a, a need for coherence, a term the psychologists use frequently. Coherence, for those of you not familiar with it, is really our human need to convince ourselves that we're being logical and consistent in our behaviors. And this effort to oversimplify and find coherence really uh, collapses our thinking collapses our world away from the nuances of our differences and leads us straight into this sort of us versus them thinking. And so knowing that we've got these countervailing influences, this, these needs to, on the one hand, be social creatures, yet on the other hand, uh, respond a, a very, or at a very early age to differences and uh, a process that's exacerbated both by the development of our human brains, as well as how our brains respond in environments of stress and conflict, really presents the challenge uh, for us as mediators. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of the various examples of in-group, out-group uh, issues, both in society and in mediation. Um, certainly at the broadest level possible, one doesn't have to look any further than kind of opening up the internet or uh, <clears throat> uh, looking at a newspaper if you still go that route to get your news. But uh, every headline almost is an example of group dynamics at play, differences between in-groups and out-groups, whether it's country versus country, whether it's religion versus religion, where, whether it's ethnicity versus ethnicity, where it's fight over resources, um, they're all classic examples. Some of these examples are seemingly harmless while still illustrative. I mean, I mean, in the United States, if you happen to be a sports fan, you know, there's huge dividing lines between whether you're a, a fan of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the New York Yankees or the uh, New York Mets or in California, whether you're a fan of the Los Angeles Dodgers or the San Francisco Giants, and I could go on. Uh, the, the consequences aren't quite as harmless when you're in Europe and you're talking about European soccer leagues or, or fo football, as they call it. And oftentimes it requires chain link fences to keep fans apart from each other simply because they're wearing different jerseys on a given day. 
<laughs> That's uh, such as the impact of uh, in-group versus out-group uh, dynamics. I'll give you other examples, some of which come from literature, some of which come from my own mediation experience. I think one of the classic uh, examples of uh, in-group, out-group um, behavior is really the Stanford prison experiment, uh, both because of, of uh, what it illustrates about in-group, out-group thinking, but also because of how quickly it can formulate in folks who may not think they're otherwise predisposed. And in that experiment, professors uh, at Stanford in the psychology department arranged a uh, experiment where they were going to take a certain number of students into the basement of the psychology building for two weeks, half of whom were designated as prison guards, half of whom were to be treated as prisoners. And the experiment commenced and continued only for a matter of several days before it had to be stopped because the professors saw people getting into their roles so distinctly and so aggressively that they feared for the physical and psychological well-being of the student participants and thereby realized just how deeply and strongly this in-group, out-group dynamic could be at play. Um, in mediations, I've seen many examples, groups of employees uh, who are mediating um, uh, in cases against uh, employer groups, whether they are um, I'm going to try and avoid using names uh, whenever possible. Drivers of uh, certain kinds of rental vehicles uh, that you dial up on your phone as a group and talking about management um, and the us versus them mentality that uh, divides those uh, conversations. Certainly, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple examples of some homeowner association disputes, but homeowner versus homeowner uh, uh, disputes are uh, not uncommon in this increased day and age of people retiring into homeowner communities. Um, there was an example um, I'll give of a case I mediated, attempted to mediate voluntarily several years back involving a local Jewish synagogue in our community. It was attempting to expand both its physical uh, space as well as its hours of operation. And very quickly, the letters to the editor and sort of other anecdotes evidenced a division within the community that uh, threatened to sort of rapture uh, an otherwise peaceful neighborhood. And I brought people together at a local, I'll call sort of neutral church to engage a dialogue. And I think the first thing I noticed was that sort of on opposite sides of the table, those sort of representing the synagogue and those representing the neighborhood association were people that I was familiar with who had sat shoulder to shoulder in school fundraising events who had coached various sports for their children alongside me. And otherwise, uh, one would have thought were very strongly connected. Yet over this one issue and very quickly, divisions had arisen and uh, threatened to really jeopardize the uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, certainly, I've mediated cases involving hospitals, local hospitals, community hospitals in the same community who were divided over how emergency care was to be delivered within uh, that community. Folks that should have shared a common goal and interest in trying to add value to uh, um, uh, and, and provide emergency health care to those in the community. Uh, that was really, uh, should have been the overarching need. And yet the dispute had devolved into uh, differences uh, based on who was perceived to be in group and who was perceived to be out group. Um, certainly startup companies, um, fighting over patent rights, one organization versus the next, uh, coming from different cultural backgrounds, exacerbating the in-group versus out-group differences. Uh, recently, I mediated a case involving a German manufacturing concern, and the logistics of trying to fold in people from Germany by Zoom uh, heightened the idea that there was a very different in-group versus out-group perspective on how business should be conducted in the United States versus perhaps how it was being conducted in Europe. Um, all of these are examples, but if, if there's an ability to, to find a dividing line in conflict, whether it's based on geographic boundaries, ethnic boundaries, religious boundaries, uh, cultural boundaries, corporate boundaries, people will find that dividing line and people will uh, exacerbate those differences. And uh, therein lies the challenge for us as mediators. So what do we do? Uh, as mediators, uh, as first responders to conflict, recognizing people's natural tendency towards divisiveness and polarization. Um, what do we do to overcome people's uh, natural inclination to 
generalize, to marginalize, to polarize, and at times stereotype each other uh, in the midst of conflict. Um, how do we return people to their better selves uh, and really to their more natural need for connection defined in the broadest possible sense? These are the issues that confront us as mediators and the issues that we take on every day in mediation. And what I hope to do uh, in the remainder time we have together is walk through a variety of examples of strategies supported by uh, uh, mediation experience in many instances, sometimes experiences I've uh, had the pleasure of hearing from others in the mediation community, all to sort of illustrate the many things that we should be thinking about and actively pursuing as we attempt to uh, bridge divides. Um, so let's, let's start with some of those strategies. Uh, the first strategy I'm gonna share with you is really uh, that of uh, starting early uh, and being patient uh, in the process. Uh, everybody knows my favorite word or one of my favorite words in mediation is deceleration. And I'm gonna put out there that in intense conflict involving deep-seated, strongly held beliefs, that it's gonna take more time than most people appreciate and that most mediators are willing to devote to unravel that ball of string, sometimes years in the making. Since uh, I brought up Bill Dury's name already, I'll continue. Uh, years ago, when Bill and I were sort of sharing dinner, with Susan, at the International Academy of Mediator Conference uh, in uh, uh, Scotland, um, Bill was sharing with us his uh, approach to uh, trying to reconcile and bring peace to the Colombian government and FARC uh, rebe uh, rebels who had been at war for literally 50 years, a process that had been uh, in conflict for decades. They were now seeking to try and resolve in the matter of days or weeks. So it's, it's important from the standpoint of developing your mediator's mind, another phrase that hopefully most of you have been introduced to at this point, but developing a mindset that uh, you need to begin early uh, and you need to be patient uh, and persevere uh, in this effort because group differences um, are oftentimes more deeply seated than personal differences. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, years ago, uh, I mediated a case involving a retirement, uh, semi-retirement uh, community. Again, I'm gonna avoid labels, but in California, it's an area that's well known as a retirement uh, mecca. And there were two competing homeowner associations under a master association. So by definition, legally and otherwise, they had some degree of connection. And yet when I was brought into this case, I encountered two homeowner association boards and associations that were literally at war. Although they were uh, shared uh, certain common amenities, they were and lived next door to each other, literally. Uh, they uh, fought heavily over what entrances to the subdivision different people could use. They put up signs that were antagonistic uh, to each other and engaged in a host of other petty behaviors that signaled there were deep divides. And if you, if you think these were unintelligent, uh, misinformed individuals, you would be wrong. Board members included a, ch a chairman of the board on one side who was a retired um, law school professor at a top tier university in the United States. Uh, board members included retired executives of uh, aerospace companies, some of the most sophisticated and successful people you could imagine now in retirement were chairing these boards and guiding their homeowners associations in this us versus them environment. And it took me, um, well, when I came in, I learned pretty quickly, not only had the local judge thrown up her hands and said, this is either a private mediation or trial, I'm done with you. A mediator who I knew to be an excellent mediator had previously uh, tried and failed in some respects uh, to navigate these group differences. And that was the environment I walked into. And it took me five mediations over the better part of 14 months, including going to a year end annual homeowners association meeting, speaking to a group of 75 or 100 angry homeowners, explaining to them why peace with dignity made sense over what was about to befall them, which was mutually assured destruction and litigation. 
And that's just one example of us versus them thinking between people who otherwise would have been uh, neighbors without recognizable differences other than this artificial divide that really labeled them uh, as a homeowner association A and homeowner association B. So um, think about um, uh, the need to be uh, patient, to persevere, to start as early as possible uh, in these instances and recognize that disputes that are years in the making in many instances are not gonna be unraveled in a day or a week. And unless you're prepared to commit that level of energy and stick to itiveness, you may be the wrong person for the job. Next, um, seek to listen for indications that there is an us versus them conflict, either apparent or underlying the surface. What do I mean by that? Well, if you can identify that there is an us versus them or in-group versus out-group phenomena, it's gonna help alert you to many of these strategies and the need to really be thoughtful and attentive to developing these strategies. How do you do that? Well, when people start using language that is a generalization, when they start saying they are all the same or they could care less about us or those kinds of things that reflect an inability to think about people from in a human perspective and simply identify them as a group, you may well be in the midst of uh, a group divide and you may need to pay special attention to techniques for how you're gonna bridge those divides uh, going forward. Um, the next example is that um, every day, and one of the challenges in this profession as an aside, I've often said this to mediators who are newer to the profession, there's many challenges in this profession, we all know that, but one of the distinct challenges, one that at times, frankly, is a bit exhausting, is that if we're working with new people every day, as many of us are, uh, every day we begin a new process. Every day we start anew the challenge and need to connect and to connect deeply with those parties in front of us, those parties in dispute. And so this third strategy it has to do with how do we build deep connections? How do we develop authenticity and credibility to form the highest possible platform as we attempt to help parties overcome this in-group, out-group phenomena? Um, Deep connections, as we know in mediation generally, are essential. Uh, they're essential for developing our credibility and building trust uh, with people in the process. Um, they're what you're gonna need to tackle the challenges throughout the day, and they're especially what you're gonna need to sort of take on the deeper seated challenges of in-group versus out-group disputes. <laughs> um, it's um, essentially, uh, it's essential uh, to what we do uh, in this process and without, um, the degree of trust being established. Parties aren't going to listen to you. Parties certainly aren't going to accept thoughts and recommendations. And worse possible, parties may dismiss your efforts entirely, given the stress they're under in conflict. So pay particular attention and devote the time necessary to building those deep connections, developing that authenticity in your relationship with them, and ultimately seeking to find that high degree of credibility and trust with everyone in the process. Um, in terms of another strategy, again, these sort of overlap uh, uh, generally with mediation, but really I think require sort of a higher degree of focus and uh, uh, attention uh, when you're in this uh, group divide uh, environment, but showing empathy and the ability to show empathy as mediators. It's a deeper conversation, obviously. It goes along with what we've taught in other courses about developing emotional competency. Uh, but showing empathy uh, is critical as a tool of trying to develop connection and trust. People want their uh, feelings uh, heard and respected. Um, and there is a difference between empathy and sympathy. We talk about in other courses, empathy sort of uh, uh, demonstrating the ability to experience someone else's feelings uh, as opposed to sympathy, which is uh, sometimes more of an expression of caring or concern about what someone has been through. One can be both empathetic and sympathetic, although empathy tends to build trust and connection perhaps more deeply as it's often viewed as sort of a more genuine response. Again, I'll give you some examples. Several years ago, I mediated a uh, 
hotel fire in Las Vegas. It was a transient hotel, uh, meaning lower lowest of income people who were being housed in this three-story environment. And a, a fire broke out uh, late one night, uh, somebody using a space heater in the midst of winter and flames engulfed the building. People jumped out of second and third floor windows and sort of ran for their lives. Not everyone made it, but those who did, didn't have the economic resources to find themselves back in a housing environment and were living on the street. And when we had them come in for mediation to talk with us, it wasn't uncommon to shed a tear or two when people talked about their destitute lives and what um, a simple transition from a housed environment to living on the street meant for them and sometimes their children. The ability to show empathy is critical in developing that degree of uh, trust and connection that we've been talking about. Um, a different uh, separate um, strategy for trying to bridge the divide is an important one and one that is a longer, deeper conversation, but I'm gonna uh, put it out there now and, and add it to the list. And it's bringing people who are in conflict into the same physical space. And this brings us back to the time-honored, time-worn debate about whether we have uh, group conversations in mediation, whether or not uh, uh, we move uh, quickly and separately uh, into breakout rooms. And, and I get all of that sort of uh, debate, but as it relates to group differences, bringing people into conflict into the same physical space is an important first step to overcome people's natural tendency when in conflict to think in simplistic generalized terms, to often polarize the opposition, to sometimes demonize the opposition, and yet bringing those people into the room forces people to confront each other as human beings and to recognize that there are, uh, at the outset, certain similarities. Um, when you bring people into the common space, I do understand that you need to set up appropriate guardrails to ensure that we're creating a safe uh, um, and hopeful environment, uh, which we've all learned about in our various courses. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, just yesterday, I was mediating a dispute between a large construction organization and a business of drivers, uh, many of whom reflected an ethnic group. <clears throat> and um, the folks on the construction side uh, resisted at 9.05 my invitation to bring everybody into the same room because the case presented largely as a sophisticated accounting discrepancy meaning years of bills, overlapping bills, duplicative bills, payment questions and the like, things that cried out for people to sit down across the table and put a, uh, a sharp pen to paper and figure out the numerical differences. Yet this construction company wouldn't have it. And the, the boss of this construction company um, resisted my every attempt to try and bring them into the same space. And try as I might over the course of the morning uh, there were just no takers. I tried different breakout groups, pulling lawyers out of the room and starting the conversation, seeing if I could gain their assistance in trying to help bring their parties together. Even that fell short of the goal until um, we agreed that after lunch, uh, I was going to bring the chief financial officer from the company into a face-to-face -face meeting with the leader of the uh, driver's uh, organization. And um, when the uh, Vice president of the company who was in attendance and he was the one most resistive heard that the CFO was willing to sit down. He sort of said, well, if he's going to sit in there, I might as well sit in and listen. Great. First step. I bring them all into the conference room. I set up the guardrails, meaning I set up the uh, parameters of the conversation. I say, we're going to listen to the presentation by the uh, company first uninterrupted and uh, we'll take a break thereafter and we'll give uh, the drivers an opportunity to formulate their response. And we'll come in and we'll do the mirror image. The drivers will have a chance to respond to what they've heard uninterrupted, and we'll go from there, thinking that was all I needed to uh, begin the discussion. And we did begin the discussion. And something interesting happened pretty quickly. Uh, each side at various times would say, do you mind if I ask a quick question? No, I don't mind at all. That's why we're here. So they'd ask a question, and pretty soon, uh, the, the conversation began to develop back and forth. And I noticed something else. I noticed that this uh, 
uh, vice president of the company, who had heretofore been swiveled in his chair, looking out the window, somewhat physically disengaged by body language, turned back toward the table, was now leaning into the table with a box of documents in front of him, actually started pulling documents out of the box, even asked a question or two, and ultimately gave his opinion on why he felt he didn't need to pay these bills. So bringing people in conflict into the same physical space has the ability to sort of soften and humanize uh, the conversation. And it's one of the many reasons that I'm such a proponent of trying to look for opportunities to engage people in these joint sessions. There's so much that can be accomplished uh, in those sessions and the uh, default setting that so many people have that are quick to say, we don't need those kinds of things or we've done those in the past, uh, just really don't ultimately add up. Um, I'll give you another example. Several years ago, I mediated a case involving the largest utility in California and the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, the facts of the case are not particularly important, uh, but it involved sort of large underground piping deficiencies uh, that uh, involved neighborhoods that were jeopardized by decaying uh, infrastructure. And we had set up a two day mediation and we had talked about who was going to be in attendance. And we arrived on the first day and lo and behold, the largest utility in California, the gentleman who had committed to coming to this two day mediation process had been called away because of the wildfires in California, the emergency need to try and address the fallout from those fires. But the consequence of the in-group, out-group thinking was that the folks at the uh, city and county of San Francisco felt disrespected, felt that they didn't have an equal peer at the negotiating table. And I quite literally spent the entire first day trying to overcome that um, um, uh, roadblock and dealing with the in-group, out-group differences between people who felt they were not being respected, that they demonized the other group to a large degree. And it wasn't until the very end of the first day I was able to get a breakout group uh, um, uh, of people together to talk about how we could make the next day more productive and overcome all of the hard feelings, the polarization, the demonization that had taken place to that point in time. Um, so don't overlook the uh, value of bringing people in conflict into the same physical space, because in that last example, day two of that mediation was a much different um, um, process. People actually engaging each other in conflict, us actually moving a case toward resolution, but partly because we'd broken down some of those initial barriers. Another strategy is really a communication type strategy. Um, and that is to sort of allow the opportunities for individuals to share their stories. Uh, a word about storytelling. There's a lot of different ways we communicate, some more effective than others. And we oftentimes ask questions and get answers and engage back and forth in real time. But one of the most engaging, uh, persuasive, memorable uh, ways to communicate is storytelling. It's why when you listen to a politician give a stump speech, or you listen to somebody in mediation in a joint session, talk about what's happened to them or their group. Uh, it's often a, a, a most memorable kind of moment. And at times something as mediators we latch on to, to help use and refer back to. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute uh, as we seek to try and overcome some of these group obstacles. I'll give you an example of um, uh, sort of uh, this, communication methodology as a means of personalizing people in mediation. Again, as recently as yesterday, the wife of the um, owner, uh, she was a co-owner, but the wife of the uh, husband who was the leader of the truck drivers group, um, I simply asked her a question at one point about how the last three years of this conflict had impacted the family. And I wasn't looking at my watch because that would have been disrespectful and disruptive, but it seemed like a good 15 or 20 minutes of her response. And I did nothing but nod my head and listen and lean into the conversation. As she proceeded to share with me what they had been through, including the fact that 
uh, she had just given birth to a child and was still in the hospital when she was receiving some of the earliest communications from this construction company, challenging their billing methodology and uh, basically their truthfulness and the stress that it sort of caused in her life at that point going forward. She uh, uh, segued into a conversation about how she had another child who had essentially uh, a brain aneurysm that caused epileptic seizures and the ongoing need for treating that child. She talked about the need for paying off the uh, sub drivers within their organization who had done the actual driving, but had not been paid because the company had not been paid by the construction company. But to pay off those drivers, they had to liquidate retirement funds and missed an opportunity to sort of grow their assets over the intervening years. And I could go on, but you get the idea. There were times where she was in tears. There were times where she was visibly angry, but at all times, she sort of evidenced this sort of us versus them mentality as she was seeing, thinking that her uh, company of drivers, if not the uh, underlying um, ethnic affiliation of many of those drivers was under siege. And it was a classic example of storytelling. It was a classic example of the need to uh, listen to folks uh, as they um, go through the um, um, process of grieving and uh, of really trying to uh, make real uh, what's happened in their lives. So whenever possible, give people the opportunity to share their story. Better still, have their story shared in front of other people, but not always possible. Uh, to be fully developed in front of others. But you get the idea. It's one of the most powerful vehicles we have for communicating what people have been through. It's one of the best ways to personalize people's experiences, to individualize them, to overcome the tendencies in conflict we have to uh, uh, simplify and stereotype each other in a conflict environment. Um, let's talk about another strategy, which is... Um, related to how we overcome people's inclination to generalize and stereotype. Um, and this is how we appropriately challenge perceptions, including the use of language. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you think about it from the psychological standpoint, as we talked about earlier, which is people's motivation and inclination to oversimplify, it's just the opposite. It's sort of about bringing nuance and uh, alternative possibilities back into the conversation. So for example, if in the conflict environment involving a group of, uh, of employees who are uh, 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 having certain benefits reduced and have sued their employer group, and they're talking with me about how they feel they've been bullied uh, by their senior management, I'll often pause the conversation and ask them to, be more specific in your detail about why you think somebody's bullying you, rather than let those kinds of generalizations hang in the air as part of our communication. Let's be more specific. And then I will ask for behaviors. And, and they may say, well, look, they, they took away our, our benefits. We used to get paid for uh, a half hour drive time from the yard uh, back to the job site. And we no longer get that benefit. And I'd say, yeah, I can understand why that would be uh, frustrating for you, certainly acknowledging, empathizing with uh, the message. But then I'll say something like, well, if you understood that their actions and behaviors, those of senior management, were intended to cut costs uh, in this economy where there's been a real downturn in building, and they were doing that so that they didn't have to lay people off either during the COVID environment or after, might that be an alternate explanation for these behaviors, one that really doesn't come from a position of, of bullying folks, but really of trying to assist others. And sometimes you can just see the wheels turning sort of behind people's eyes as they process that possibility, perhaps for the first time. It's why I often say to people, this idea of, of these sort of hypothetical scenarios uh, in mediation are so valuable because they force people to confront alternative narratives that for many they've not ever visited. And so most of us are incapable of holding conflicting narratives simultaneously in mind. And so even if just for an instant, we're introducing to someone a different reality, or at least a different way of processing the current reality, we're doing them the benefit 
of really trying to open their eyes and help them see each other's perspective. And so look for opportunities to challenge perceptions, look for opportunities to uh, force people to be more specific about um, generalized language. And when you hear those kinds of generalizations, uh, the bells should go off. Um, I've said this already, um, but I wanna drill down on it uh, a bit further. Um, and it's the idea of personalizing people in the process. I've already talked about one key way of doing that, which is bringing people into the room, forcing them to sit across the table from each other where they physically have to see each other in the moment. Um, another way though, to build on that uh, personalization is the repeated use of their names. And I find that a simple technique from the mediator is the uh, opportunity to uh, call people by name, ideally first names, if we can uh, get it at that level. But in certain instances, it may be uh, um, uh, using somebody's uh, title uh, as a show of respect. But either way, it helps personalize people, individualize people, separate them from a group think, uh, an outgroup uh, perception. And then refer back to the stories that people have shared, whether it's in the moment in a joint session or when you're meeting with people in follow-up in uh, private breakout conversations. Um, gee, do you remember um, when uh, 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 Ms. So-and-so said they haven't slept a single night since they realized that uh, they were gonna lose that particular job benefit? Um, refer them back to those individual stories that helps humanize and personalize the conflict. Um, even ask them questions that are uh, uh, forcing them to, for a moment to sit in the shoes of someone else, as I've already said. How would you feel if you were in that moment and that were uh, happening to you? All of these are ways to sort of personalize the dispute and bring it back down to uh, uh, a, a, a sort of a personal level. Another example, and I'm kind of getting close to the end of the list, but um, constantly reframe messages. Look, a large part of what we do in our back and forth is trying to take the poison out of the message, as a colleague of mine once described it. And so if somebody in mediation says, Bruce, go tell that uh, board president that she's a son of a, uh, and that uh, when we're through with all of this, we're going to bankrupt her company uh, and uh, enjoy the moment. You know, my typical response is, happy to deliver that message, but do you mind if I polish it up a bit so uh, they can hear it? Uh, more often than not, uh, that'll evoke a chuckle and somebody will say, yeah, I kind of expect you to do that. There are those moments when people will say, no, that's the exact message I want you to say. In which case I'll say, well, okay, I can do that. But just so we're clear, here's what might happen and don't be surprised if it does. But more often than not, our job as mediators is to take the message, to sort of dilute it to an appropriate degree and not don't rob it completely of its emotional content, but to deliver it in a way that's both fair to the sender of the message, meaning content and emotion are being delivered, but at the same time presented in a way that the other side can hear it. And that's a big nuanced skill that mediators develop over time. Uh, two more here I wanna to touch on um, in terms of particular skills. One is, um, the need for us as mediators to restore a sense of agency for those involved in conflict. What do I mean by that? Psychologists use the term agency as a description of a, a person's ability to regain a sense of, of control and autonomy in their lives. So for example, when I mediated disputes involving a group of um, um, young gymnasts who had been sexually abused and were suing gymnastic associations who had sort of failed to protect them in their young lives. It was important to me that I attended to this group of young women in a way that allowed them to uh, recognize that through settlement uh, decisions came a sense of empowerment, that they were in a position to take controls of their lives and bodies and future that maybe they hadn't possessed historically. And that restoring that sense of agency, um, that sense of dignity, that sense of control over the outcome uh, was a process that took three mediations over many months, uh, but an element of persistence that ultimately paid dividends. Um, I, I think as an aside, as I sort of think about how I approach some of these cases, one thing to avoid um, 
in trying to overcome differences. Rarely are we going to bridge a divide between groups, particularly those that FES have had long-standing uh, divisions, uh, have had uh, time to fester these differences. And lots of times people will simply, by force of will, uh, try and communicate to the other side the righteousness of their position. Oftentimes you see them relying on facts and figures and statistics. Rarely are those persuasive. That's why I'm not a huge fan of PowerPoint presentations generally, uh, because I think that sort of misses the moment in many instances. Um, what we need to do instead is appeal to these groups often with their shared values. Just yesterday, I was speaking with a mediator in the office who was about to embark on a mediation between a Baptist school and a Baptist church who shared the same physical space uh, um, didn't overlap on days of the week, but shared the same physical space and we're looking to part ways. And um, the parties coming in were encouraging each other to focus on their shared values, uh, to, to focus on their shared theological commitment to finding peaceful resolution. Um, a different example, I once uh, spoke with a mediator in South Africa and he specialized in mediating disputes between the new government in various impoverished communities. And he told me that when stalemates occurred in individual negotiations, that they tried to seek common ground. And that common ground was a recognition that they couldn't go back to the old ways, the old days of apartheid and the murderous conflict that so divided that nation. And in searching for that common ground, they really, uh, uh, found a, a renewed purpose. Um, one last uh, advice, a uh, uh, piece of advice in terms of skills to bridge devices, uh, divides, and then I want to open things up for questions in a moment. Uh, but that's what Bill Urey describes as looking for an opportunity to build a golden bridge. It used to be in the book, The Art of War, uh, the author described a golden bridge as establishing a road for retreat for your enemy uh, at the outset of the war. Um, in his book, Getting Past No, Dr. Yuri sort of changed that a bit and suggested that we should look for ways to build a bridge uh, toward each other, a build of a, a bridge rather of, of affirmation. Regardless of how we contemplate it, this idea of uh, seeking to build a golden bridge uh, to divide group differences, I think, is a very sort of important uh, uh, takeaway from today's conversation. So, um, a couple of things to sort of wrap up and then I wanna ask uh, for some questions. But however uh, we um, encounter these in-group, out-group differences, we need to uh, both find out about them fairly early, identify them quickly, uh, resolve ourselves with our mediator's mind that it's going to be a lengthy uh, process, one that is gonna require a tremendous amount of time and perseverance to sometimes overcome years of perceived differences and those kinds of things are not going to happen overnight. But with an appropriate amount of commitment and stick to they are resolvable problems. Uh, I sometimes find myself in mediation using different phrases. I'll say things like, the perspective you brought into this room that you've developed over years of frustrating conflict with the other side isn't the perspective that you will need today if you're going to resolve this conflict. We need to develop a new mindset and use that as a segue into conversation. I've been known at times to try and quote different people uh, to sort of find moments of shared humanity. Certainly one of my favorite uh, poets is Maya Angelou and in her poem on the human family, I particularly like the phrase, we are more alike my friends than we are unalike. We are more alike my friends than we are unalike. So um, it, it's critical that we realize that both um, society at large and the mediation room as a reflection of broader society mirrors these us versus them mindsets and brings to the table the need for us to figure out from how we got to that moment and therein lies the answer to perhaps how we can unravel that ball of string. But uh, appreciate the uh, uh, attentiveness uh, over the last hour. Let me pause for a moment, Susan, and see if questions have arisen that uh, perhaps I can uh, address in the time remaining. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. We have a number of questions that have come in. I'm going to ask Michael to unmute and ask his question. He put his hand up in the very beginning. Great. Michael? 
get your microphone on. Okay, I will now go to, I will jump to Leslie. Okay. Um, Leslie, do you, are you able to ask your question? Okay, then what I'm gonna do is jump to the Q and A's because we do have a lot of, um, of questions that have come in. So um, first one. Thank you, Bruce. Very apt and timely for some of us in Nigeria. The last presidential election in 23 was very divisive and several months ethnic influence bitterness still lingers up to government levels and in political appointments. How can Nigeria heal? That's a long one, but remember, we have a number of other questions, please. Um, well, I think one has to approach things thoughtfully, strategically, and using the kinds of skills that I've just articulated. Uh, look, there is no greater lesson in the world of failed uh, ability to bridge a divide between in-group and out-group uh, than what happened in Rwanda in the genocide. And um, while Susan and I have made numerous trips, both to Rwanda and other African nations, Rwanda's experience looms large for all nations. Paul Kagame, their president, was in the United States about a month ago uh, giving a talk at the US National Prayer Breakfast, uh, really trying to address the question of after a country loses a million people in genocide, how do you possibly repair the company, the country rather? How do you bridge that divide? And after talking a lot about uh, the uh, reconciliation and forgiveness opportunities that uh, needed to be uh, exhausted, he said, healthy nations are those where we always strive to put the politics of unity and peace above all else, no matter how many times we fall short of that ideal. It is the practice of reconciliation in matters large and small, which creates and recreates healthy nations and turns strangers and enemies into a family of citizens. I would commend you to read Paul Kagame's speech to the uh, US uh, National Prayer Breakfast in your search for answers. Um, okay, I have another one from Selma. Thank you for this interesting presentation. I am a research mediator who hasn't gotten the chance to practice yet. I would like to ask, in some conflicts with cultural or ethnic differences when the mediator faces impasse, could he or she ask for a co-mediator from a different culture to build trust when disputants resist the attempt to temper those dis differences? Interesting. No, it's a great question. And it's certainly one of the many benefits I talk about when we discuss co-mediation as a concept. Um, but it does provide the opportunity to bring in people from diverse backgrounds to help bridge the divide almost demographically in the mediation team as you approach conflict resolution. And whether that occurs at the outset because you uh, have foreshadowing of these differences and therefore devise a mediation team that reflects differences ethnically, religiously, educationally, et cetera, uh, or it's something that you have to uh, turn to once you reach impasse in mediation, either way is an appropriate consideration of that benefit. So absolutely, is a short answer to the question, look for those uh, opportunities, even ask those questions if you reach a particular divide. Might you be more comfortable with a different mediator altogether? Might you be more comfortable with a team of mediators that uh, uh, share some more of the uh, background of the parties? I think those are all important ways to identify ways out of an intractable moment. Um, Dan asked, how much of what you do in these settings is being a psychologist in reading the parties and maneuvering them from parameters to a common goal? <laughs> Well, it's hard to sort of define moment to moment. Is my thinking based on psychology? Is it based on law? Is it based on sociology? You know, human communication lessons I've learned. It's just things we, uh, as you've learned in our course, uh, that you do until they become second nature, that many of them have a, a psychological component. What I'm trying to do in today's uh, conversation is give you a deeper understanding of some of the reasons why we get these types of divides and, and to sort of fashion and develop a skill set that's premised on how to overcome these at a, a sort of neurobiological, anthropological level. But in the room, obviously, I speak very differently, and I'm not uh, 
talking to people about psychology generally, uh, I, or, or certainly anthropology. I'm addressing them in the moment at a level that corresponds with their needs uh, while I'm thinking about all of these various lessons and strategy. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, this is a question that came in. It's very similar to one that came in writing. Um, how to deal with one of the parties who try to manipulate others in the mediation process? Well, uh, I think everybody's trying to manipulate each other in the mediation process. I think that goes back to your mental model. You, th you start by assuming that people are trying to manipulate, persuade. We can use a variety of different words. I think the question, the import of the question is whether somebody is doing that to an unconscionable degree. And how do you deal with a difficult personality who's sort of overbearing and trying to be, uh, uh, if not disruptive, at least uh, uh, overbearing in their effort to persuade. And those people, sometimes you uh, keep them physically separate from the other side, despite what I've said previously in the last hour. Uh, you isolate them a bit so that people are not off put particularly, and you can help take the poison out of their communication style and behavior as you're uh, attempting to create a more uh, productive dialogue between the sides. Uh, and you try and diffuse over time that uh, type of approach. Oftentimes that type of approach is a reflection uh, itself of an unmet need or interest, meaning maybe somebody hasn't been listened to and just simply listening to them for the first time as I did yesterday for the better part of 20 minutes when they had been almost, um, uh, they had been impacted dramatically by the other side's unwillingness to even answer a phone call or respond to an email for the last several years. The need was overwhelming in terms of the need to be listened to. And once I addressed that need and listened to them, they became uh, a much different person in how they approached communication. So a variety of those techniques, depending on how you assess the moment. Um, Bruce, since, this is from Cosma. Since you mentioned at the beginning in the, of this session, there are neurobiological factors at play in the group differences present in a mediation. In this respect, could it be that the left-brained people and the right-brained people stand against each other in their divide? There's a lot of ways to sort of dissect why people are divided in those groups. There are people that have taken uh, the, the MMPI personality inventory and sort of say, well, the reason that I haven't gotten along with my boss is that I'm a, you know, and they describe what the testing has revealed about their personality versus my boss who is a, and then they reveal the type of uh, personality that their boss reflects. And, and sometimes that can be helpful in trying to bridge the divide because you can then structure communication in a way that others can hear. At other times, it may exacerbate the in-group, out-group thinking, and you may need to circle back towards shared values and, and similarities as opposed to some of those communication differences. Um, that's what I would attend to. Um, I'm going to open it up. I see Leslie's come back in. So I'm going to, Leslie, can you ask your question? You need to unmute yourself. I don't know what your question is, so I can't respond and I can't ask Bruce to respond in writing. Mm -hmm. um, she is why, don't we ask, why don't we ask her to submit the question in writing and I'll be happy to respond to it after today. Okay, I, that would be great. Um, okay, a few more. Um, how important is it to meet individually with members of an in-group or out-group in a neighborhood association dispute, for example, and then in parens, one-on-one -on -one meetings with each individual, regardless of the group, for example, before considering how to bring them together in a mediation session. It, it is not always practical, but how important could it be as a part of the preparation? I think it's extraordinarily important. Your question sort of asks the question, where, when, and who uh, you know, do I meet? I think all of those should be addressed. The when I've already addressed early as possible in terms of trying to get a feel for the players, the sense of the divide, how people are looking at the divide, the sooner you start that, the better. Where those conversations take place, uh, I, as I said, I has, have spent time speaking to the homeowner associations, driving into neighborhoods, meeting people in their homes. All of that helps establish a deeper sense of commitment, credibility, and trust, which I've identified as being an essential platform for the effort that we're going to go to in resolving these differences. Uh, and um, 
uh, I have the question of talking to people individually to personalize them and to help personalize others in the conflict and breaking apart that sense that we're somehow the same, whether it's within the in-group or the, in viewing the out-group. The more we can create and uh, understand those individual differences, the closer we'll be to figuring out how to bridge that divide. Okay, James asks, what do you do with parties who hold, a very, strong, who hold very strong positions in a conflict involving land and property where they are emotionally attached and believe that the other party is, is being more powerful, is acting in bad faith? Uh, one of the uh, mediator's least favorite phrases, of course, because if I had a dime for every time I heard somebody accuse others of bad faith behavior, <laughs> I wouldn't have to charge by the hour. But that said, um, it, your question really goes to the core of dealing with difficult people, overcoming impasse, and trying to bridge these seemingly intractable divides. It really goes to the heart of what we were talking about today. Um, it doesn't lend itself to a very brief, pithy 25 word answer, other than it's a constellation of all of the various skills that we as mediators have been trying to impart uh, amongst ourselves, uh, trying to understand the depth of the conflict, uh, trying to engage people at a human level, uh, trying to establish communication or reestablish communication in effective ways, and all of the various things that uh, we teach in the mediation skills course and beyond, I think, are critical to those kinds of disputes. The dispute that you just described, while extraordinarily challenging, because sometimes it reflects uh, generational or family issues as well, um, but it's something that just requires a tremendous amount of planning, preparation, and perseverance uh, to try and overcome. Okay, let's see. Um... I may have time for one more, and then I'm going to have to start mediation myself again today. But uh, what do you have? Um, I've got to go through. Oh, there's a number of them. Yeah. Um, That's a good thing. It is a good thing. Um, and we will get to all of these, I promise you. Um, the commonality or the sum total of the personal interests of the members of an in-group appear to be central to in-group dynamics. If the commonality breaks down, then perhaps the in-group itself would break down. Could you therefore, well, could therefore breaking down this commonality, or in other words, perhaps breaking down the in-group itself be a possible strategy to overcome in-group and out-group barriers? Interesting. It is interesting. I'm not sure I've thought about it specifically in that uh, fashion, but I do think it's a corollary of what we're trying to do when we individualize and personalize conflict, not just across the divide, but within each other. You're right. There may well be differences uh, within the group. Um, yesterday in my mediation, there were people who um, um, uh, jumped in um, uh, uh, to the uh, mediation by Zoom. And I could hear through the wall that uh, the front door that there were differences of opinion going on within that in group as we uh, uh, got more uh, deeply involved in the negotiation. Um, all right, I've got uh, folks who are waiting for me uh, in the mediation room. I apologize for uh, uh, having to bring this interesting conversation to a head. I'll ask Susan to forward to me uh, those um, questions that we didn't have time to answer. And I'll try and get answers out to everybody as soon as I can, uh, my mediation schedule this week permitting. But thank you for the great questions. Thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for all that you do to help bridge divides and uh, look forward to continuing these conversations.